Good morning, church. I am uh, away in a manger. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> I'm out here in my my um, new little office out in the back and a uh, little temporary studio uh, that we have set up. <clears throat> anyway, I want to uh, welcome you and say Merry Christmas or Merry Christmas Eve, as it were. And uh, let's let's begin with a prayer, shall we? <clears throat> Father, this is um, this is it for us. This is the this is the most monumental celebration in the Christian calendar, is to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Um, Lord, the the cross is immensely important as well. But I think, as we'll see today, the incarnation is the beginning. The incarnation is the is the moment of our salvation in Jesus Christ. It is through his entry into our human experience as a creature, as one of us, that cements our union with you. And so it is your plan from before the foundations of the earth. So, Lord, help us to celebrate it today, to be excited about what you've done um, I feel like jumping up and down for joy. And uh, anyway, Lord, um, bless us, Holy Spirit. Uh, reveal to us the, the, the warmth and the radiant weight of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to read you a little bit today. Um, uh, well, we have a memory verse, and I always forget this, but you see, I'm, I'm, doing, the, uh, I'm doing all this solo today so i'm looking right at the the screen so let's let's look at the memory verse and uh, we won't try to memorize it you know because we're not all together in person so it'd be almost impossible um you know for us to do that but here it is all right it's john 1 14 and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. So that will um, that will be our flagship passage today. And um, I'm just checking the audio there. Sorry if I look distracted. Um, that'll be our flagship passage today. Of course, in John one. I mean, where else are you going to go um, at Christmas time? I know there's a, there's plenty of narratives to read, but I I think from a theological standpoint, from an ontological standpoint, in other words, what this means for you and I in our personal being. Like ontology is just a fancy word for me. Uh, it's, it's the study of or the logic of our being. What's the logic of your being? The logic of your being is Jesus. Jesus is the logos. He is the word. He is now the logic of our being. He's the final say. He's the final word of our being. So um, we're going to look at that today. So let's begin reading in John, um, on, uh, John 1, verse 1. And I'm going to read it from my physical Bible. Uh, you know, I'm staring at a computer screen right now. So, you know, obviously I could just read it there. Um, but I, I love my paper Bible. In fact, I, was, um, I was, uh, sent a message to uh, Dr. Matt Pandel, um, who is... Um, supervising some um some um academic work that i'm that i'm doing and uh he's written a book um about living in the um in the in-between and uh, i ordered a paper copy i didn't want just the kindle copy and that's because i said when the when the electro uh, what is it the electromagnetic pulse machines uh, finally take out civilization and we go back to the stone age i want my I want my paper books because I'm going to have amassed a library of paper books and then, uh, you know, I can barter for that. You know, if you want to come read uh, a few books in my library, well, you know, you got to bring maybe, maybe you bring a couple of chicken eggs or, um, or something and I'll let you read a book. But um, I say that in jest. Uh, there is something organic and, um, you know, just that the the texture of holding the book in your hand and and I like my 
I like my Bible, my paper Bible. In the beginning, John 1, 1 was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Such powerful words. And he was in the beginning with God. And, of course, this word with, pros, means face to face. John isn't telling us about a father and a son who are, you know, skipping down the lane uh, in close proximity. Um, he's telling us about a father and son who are in face-to-face -face union, turned toward one another. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. If it exists, Jesus made it. And what came into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. So, if there's, if you see light, that's coming from Jesus. If you see light in in a a, a, a baptized, Bible believing, church going, tithing, uh, what else? Um, front row sitting, amening. What else do we uh, laud in that? 13 year perfect Sunday school attendance pen, whatever. Volunteer Sunday school teacher. Doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if you see light in that person that comes from Jesus, well, what about the person that says, I don't even believe in God? If there's light, if you see light, it's coming from Jesus. What about what about the, the person that worships a false god, a false religion? Well, if you see light there, if you see any light, it's coming from Jesus. Life and light have but one source. His name is Jesus. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Hallelujah. There's a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light. So that all might believe through him. Now you might, you know, there's an opportunity, I guess, to be a little bit confused. Especially for a new reader. Um, you're reading a book entitled The Gospel of John. And then you're reading about a John. Well, it's not the same John, right? Um, so think of, um, you know, some names are are uh, pretty ubiquitous in cultures. Uh, um it, it may be a very common name um, at the time. Lots of people were named John. So, But this is a different John. Uh, John, the disciple that is writing this gospel account, is speaking of a man named John the Baptist, a woolly wild man, um, grizzly Adams kind of fella, um, wild and, and untamed, my kind of guy, right? He uh, didn't, didn't follow the rules necessarily, uh, sort of sort of lived his own way, paved his own road, and uh, you pay for that. You do. You, you, if you're going to live that way, you got to understand that um, um, there's going to be some consequences. Um, Nikki Six once said, if you're going to live life on your own terms, you got to be willing to crash and burn. So um, John the Baptist was kind of like that, and, and part of his... Uh, Part of the consequences of the way he lived is, you know, he was unkempt and raggedy clothes and had to live off the land. And there wasn't a lot where, to, uh, uh, to live off of in the land where he was. And so he ate wild honey and locusts and probably caught a lot of fish, ate a lot of fish. Verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He was coming. He's in the world. Wait. John the disciple, the beloved disciple here, is mixing up all kinds of past and present tense. Well, he's, I don't think he's mixed up. I think he sees more than perhaps sometimes we see. He sees that this, this Jesus that has become a human being is before everything that we know in creation. Um, and he was entering the world as a human being. Uh, the world did not know him. He came to his own, verse 11, and his, his own people did not accept him. But all who received him, who believed in his name, what name? Jesus, that name, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, that name, that's a good name. He gave power to become children of God. 
who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. How about that? That's born again, born from above. The word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. <laughs> There's some of that past and present. All right, he came after me, but he ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Well, how much older was John the Baptist than Jesus? six months right we know uh, from the from the uh, narratives uh, that uh, Elizabeth was six months pregnant when um, when when uh, Mary found out she was gonna have a baby um, when when John the Baptist says he ranks ahead of me because he was before me, John the Baptist knows that Jesus is the eternal Son of the Father. He predates creation. From his fullness we have received grace upon grace, the disciple writes. We have received grace upon grace from out of what? From his fullness, his pleroma, his his beauty and light and love and goodness and other-centeredness that flows so thoroughly through everything that it fills up the cosmos. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Is John suggesting the law is not graceful and true? No one has ever seen God. And this word um, uh, seen here is uh, horeo, I think. Um, I could look it up. I think that's the word. But it means to properly discern. Um, people have, have cast their eyes, right? But properly discern God? Never. It is God, the only Son, who is, it, in my translation, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard, it says, um, who is close to the Father's heart. That's so anemic. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, that's, um, my, my daddy would say, um, anything that scrawny needs a parvo shot. Um, that's, a, that's a scrawny sentence. That's an anemic, weak, thin, frail. Somebody needs to buy that, that sentence a sandwich or a whole turkey dinner. Fatten them up over Christmas. That's... So let's fatten up that sentence. All right, let's do it this way. We'll we'll do it um, we'll do it in a way that is more um, authentic and true to the meaning. Uh, if you read the in the King James version, which it has its own issues, but it gets this right. It is God, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. Jesus isn't just side by side, like we said, skipping down the sidewalk close to the Father's heart. Jesus is in the Father. He indwells the Father. Remember John 14, verse 20, just a few chapters down the road here. Jesus says, in that day you will know that I'm in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Right? They mutually indwell one another. But I want to go back. There's, there's, um, there's great import. In, uh, in verse 14, if we, if we read it um, properly, if we, if, we get a, um, if we get a good translation, a faithful translation uh, into English from the original, and I'm going to, let's see if I can do this, if I can get you, I don't know if you can read that or not, um, it was really hard for me to make, um, but in, in any case, um, I want to um, I want to read this to you as the as the Greek New Testament writes it. Okay, let me pull it up here, John 1:14, and I'm going to go to the Greek New Testament, and this is this is literally how the Greek New Testament. And the word order may not be what we're accustomed to, but this is the way the word order would be in Koine Greek. And the word flesh became, 
and he tented in us and we watched the splendor of him splendor as only born from father full of favor and truth well how about that in us he tented in us not just among us not just among us in us he made his dwelling in you the incarnation is so much more than Jesus becoming a human being so he could hang out for a few years and then appease an angry father and maybe maybe someday if we're lucky slip us in the back door of heaven while the father isn't looking no Jesus becomes a human being to include humanity into his life of love with the father and uh, you know we're gonna we always do um, I'm gonna have to do something else about my copy of Athanasius um, I have carried it in my Bible case alongside my Bible for oh I don't know maybe 15 years now and I, I this book was printed in 1944 it's a it's a first edition of Lewis's um, the, the copy with Lew, uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, introduction and I've, I've read it so many times that, you know, pages are falling out of it and whatnot. So um, it, it may be time to retire this, this particular copy. But I, I dearly love it. It means a lot to me. Um, the first time I read this book, um, I, I confess, I think I, I think I read, I read this work in 2006 and I just it all went over my head I mean, there were parts of it maybe that didn't but I remember the following year I had uh, then been under the tutelage of Dr. C. Baxter Kruger for some time uh, maybe just maybe just um, six to eight months and uh, so a lot of a lot of the things that I had read were beginning to make a little more sense and yeah, put in proper context you know with some with some some um, some mentoring. Uh, Tim Brussell was greatly helpful in that in the in the very beginning as well. Um, but I want to read section 14. We always read this. I reread this book every year before Christmas, and I highly recommend that you do the same. In section 14, Athanasius says, you know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains. The artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for it again. And then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. Even so it was with the all-holy Son of God, He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that He might renew mankind made after Himself and seek out His lost sheep, even as He says in the Gospel, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. This also explains His saying to the Jews, except a man be born anew, dot, dot, dot. I love those dots. He was not referring to a man's natural birth from his mother as they thought, but to the rebirth and recreation of the soul in the image of God. Athanasius was only 21 years old when he wrote that. Um, he stood by himself for 30 years against the Arian heresy. The Roman government tried to, tried to shut him up. They, tried to, they, they defrocked him, I don't know, five times, kicked him out, brought him back, kicked him out, and... Um, at, at one, at, on two occasions, they, they tried to just have him killed. They tried to do it through the legal system, and he, he beat them at their own game, and then they just sent somebody to go, uh, so an, an attachment of Roman soldiers just to go assassinate him, and he, he slipped away there too. Um, there are a great many people I want to meet when I get to heaven someday, and Athanasius is, is at very close to the top of that list. Jesus becomes a human being, not merely so that he can save us from our sins. When Jesus enters humanity, he doesn't enter into uh, our experience as something other than what we are. He enters as us, as you and I. He, he has a carnal mind. He has a mind capable of thinking wrong thoughts about God. Jesus enters into our creaturely world so thoroughly he is, I guess in theory you could say, 
he could have sinned. He could have blown it. Um, it's called the impossible possibility. There's no possibility that Jesus would betray the the Father and, and his 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 love and and mutual indwelling in the communion of the Holy Spirit with God the Father. But he became exactly what we are. In fact. It is uh, Gregory of Nazianzus who says the unassumed is the unhealed, right? So in other, in other words, whatever Jesus did not assume in his incarnation remains unhealed. So if Jesus didn't become as much a human being as you and I, then there's, there's some part of humanity that's left unredeemed, that's not been healed, that's untouched by the incarnation. I, I read Jesus' final words from the cross as, it is finished. Um, he, didn't, he didn't leave anything off the to-do list. He checked all the boxes. So let's, let's uh, conclude. Man, I hope this has been good news for you today. It's such good news for me. I think about it. I don't know when you think about Jesus becoming a human being as you, for you, in you, with you, and when you the most. Um, but when I'm, when I'm, when I, when I get it wrong, you know, I, I do something I shouldn't do. I think something I know I shouldn't think, or I say, so, especially if I say something out of the way to a person, that's, that, that, all right, confession time. That didn't bother me, uh, when I was a young man. I could be rude to somebody or short with somebody. Um, you know, a long time ago when I was a little bitty boy, I learned how to hide a knife in a, uh, in a word, and I got really good at it. In, in fact, we used to play a game called Cuts. We would play a game, we called it Cuts, where we would cut each other down, we called it. And, and most of the time it was for fun. Every now and then, you know, somebody would get their feelings hurt, and you'd, you know, get a chipped tooth out of the deal. I got a couple of those, but... Um, I got really good at it, and um, it didn't bother me at all. But now, I don't know. It's like the more I get to know Jesus, and I still do it. I still say things that I shouldn't say, or I get get in a bad attitude, or I get upset, and I, I might say something out of the way, uh, but it bothers me. And I, you know, I'll, I'll usually make an attempt to make it right. Um, you know, and I don't always, I don't always get that right either. When I think about the incarnation and Jesus becoming me for me the most is when I've gotten it wrong and the evil one gets in my ear and tries to tell me that God doesn't love me anymore or that somehow because of my failings um, I have fallen out of favor with God and that's not possible. And it's not possible because I have been brought into union with God. I am as much in the Father with Jesus as Jesus is. I want to finish. Um, there are two of these. Um, this one is the first. It's uh, Incarnation, the Person, Life of Christ. And it's a big one. It's a collection of um, T.F. Torrance's lectures from New College. And... Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to reach up here on the shelf, and this is the second one, you know, Atonement, um, the person and work of Christ, and uh, they are, oh, I don't know, in the neighborhood of about 500 pages each, and, uh, but his, um, his son published these books um, when he was 83 years old. Uh, T.F. Torrance had a stroke and it debilitated him for I think the last four or three or four years of his life and he was unable to finish this and uh, his son finished it for him and um, um, T.F. Torrance's nephew Robert Torrance Walker actually took up, took up the monumental task of editing all those lectures into book form and he wrote a, a forward to the book that is, well, it, it could be a book. It could be a book. It goes, uh, the forward itself goes from the editor's introduction, it's called, 
goes from XXI all the way to LII. That's a lot of pages. Notice I didn't tell you how many pages that was. Because I don't know. I'd have to count them because I don't read those Roman numerals. But I do know on, on page 32 of this book in the, in the uh, introduction, I want to read this from, from Robert Walker. Um, the introduction to this book is worth the cost of the book. It's worth the price of admission. He says this, Here, the full humanity of Christ is of equal importance with his deity. If Jesus is not God, then it is not God that has saved us, but equally... If Jesus is not man, then it is not man that has been saved. The deity and the humanity of Jesus are equally important, and neither without the other can bring salvation. For Torrance, therefore, following the early Greek fathers, it is of critical importance to believe in the full humanity of Christ, and failure to do so consistently has been a damaging weakness in the history of theology. Jesus became a human being. He assumed our fallen flesh. Why? To redeem it. To redeem it. To redeem humanity. Nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God because you are inside God who is love. How do you get separated from that? You didn't put yourself there. Jesus did. God the Father reached down from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ and got you in his capable, firm, forever grip hands and put you into himself in the person of Jesus Christ. You're in Jesus. Jesus is in the Father. So where are you? You're as face to face with the Father as is Jesus. Ours is the task of believing it because Jesus will not force you to accept it. Jesus will not force you to live as though it's true. Now, he's believing it for you, but you've got to believe it too. You've got to say yes to the yes that Jesus has made for you. Not so you can get in, not so you can be saved. No, we believe so that we can, I should say it this way, not so you can become saved. We believe it so that we can be saved, so we can be what we are so that we can experience the kingdom now. If you, um, if you have your communion elements handy, um, you may have forgotten about that. Um, I did. About 10 minutes before we were supposed to start, my wife uh, reminded me of the communion elements. So, um, you know, lucky, lucky me, right? So... Uh, if you have your communion elements, we'll take communion now together. Uh, I was thinking about that this week. The, the body of Jesus, when we talk about the body of Jesus being broken, we don't mean like literal broken bones because that was a prophecy, of course. You know, none of his bones would be broken. Um, his body was completely broken for us um, in the sense that it was so destroyed on the cross that it died and so we we honor what Jesus has done in a it, it sounds confusing but we celebrate that because in the death of Jesus we find we discover the death of humanity the death of the fall everything that had gone wrong with humanity every every system of of Adam, every system of law and old covenant, every mythology, every superstition, all of that is now dead, put to death in the death of Jesus. So we commemorate that, that broken body with this, this bread. And in the very beginning, we find that that life is in the blood. Life is in the blood, and in the very beginning, uh, when the fall took place, the first thing that happened was God killed animals and took their skins to cover Adam and Eve, to provide for them, to keep them warm, because they had entered a place 
that was no longer uh, the sanctuary that was the garden. And so God, in taking care of Adam and Eve, shed blood, a foreshadowing of how he would remedy this, this catastrophic dilemma, the divine dilemma, Athanasius calls it. What was God, he says, being good to do? So Jesus is the finality of all bloodshed. There is no longer any need for bloodshed. I sure wish we could get that through our heads today in our world. But we commemorate the end of bloodshed and the beginning of true life in this wine representing the blood of Jesus. Well, I hope you all have a, a Merry Christmas. If you, um, if you would like to um, contribute uh, to what we're doing at Grace Communion Hanover, and I see good things ahead for us, um, I do. You can visit our website, uh, gchanover.org. Um, there's, a, there's a giving fuel link up there, uh, or you can text a gift to 804-409-0445. We appreciate all that. We do. And um, we will have a service uh, in person um, next Sunday on December 31st. So uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And I uh, hope you all have a fantastic Merry Christmas. Uh, I love each and every one of you. And, and I appreciate so much your care and support and attendance um, this year. And I look forward to even more of it in the year to come. So we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.